You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number five. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news, and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Wardrobe, and thanks so much for tuning in today. When I talk to music teachers, one of the hot topics that comes up is how to scan music, and I thought I'd cover that in today's episode. There are a couple of reasons for wanting to scan music in the first place, and a number of benefits if you do. In today's show, I'm going to cover why scan music and what those benefits are. We'll talk about copyright implications of scanning. And we'll talk about how to scan two processes that are involved in scanning music and which software or apps you need. And then just to finish off, I'll just give you a couple of example workflows. Now, before we start, you can find a list of all the resources and links that I'm going to mention in the show at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash five. Let's talk about why you'd want to scan music in the first place. And really there are two main reasons for scanning music. The first one is that you might want to create a digital version of your music library so that you can read and annotate scores on your iPad or Android device or even on your laptop. The second main reason is that you might want to transform a paper score into an editable format so that you can play it back or transpose it or rearrange it and so on. Most people describe this as wanting to get notes quickly into notation software. <laughs> That's the thing that uh, the phrase that people use when they talk to me about it. Um, if you're not scanning music, the alternative is to input all of those notes of the score manually into the notation software. And some people find that really slow and tedious if they're not very um, you know, familiar with notation software and don't do it very often. It can be a long, slow process. So scanning is one of those things that can speed up the process and get the notes quickly into the notation software. Now, before we talk about scanning, I really want to do due diligence and just talk about copyright implications and to mention that it's actually not legal to scan any copyrighted music unless you have the permission of the copyright owner. Now, if you do have permission, you're fine to go ahead. Or if you compose the music yourself, of course, you can go ahead as well. And the last reason uh, for having permission might be that the music is actually in the public domain. So any of those, go for it. Um, it can be really, really useful. Let's talk about how to scan music in the first place. There are two main steps. The first one is to take a paper copy of a score and make it into a digital format. And mostly that format will be as a PDF file. And the second uh, step is to transform the digital score into a notation format. And that's like the magic bit. That's what I call the auto magically transform part of the process. And I want to look at both of those steps in depth. So to start off with digitising the score, the actual scanning process, you know, you would do this if you've got a paper copy of a score and you're thinking, well, what, what next? What's my next step? Now, there are a few different options for how to scan a score. The main aim is to get the score into a really clear, readable PDF format. In the early days of doing this, the only option was to use a physical scanner and it's still a good option. Um, some scanners can be quite slow. I've had uh, mostly one of those scanners that is super slow and you have to do one page at a time and you lie it down on the glass top of the scanning thing, you put the lid down and you wait for what seems like hours for it to go zzz, zzz, and back and scan the page. And if you've got multiple pages of a score to do, that can be really, really tedious. So um, one tip is that if you are working with individual pages, as in not a book format, and you have access to one of those big all-in-one photocopier scanner type machines, um, lots of schools have those, that's a great option for you to use. So you can put all the copies into the lid and it will just churn through them all and instantly make you a PDF version of the score. So that, that's a much better way than my version of using the old-fashioned scanner, which is quite slow. If you're working from a book, it is a much slower process. You really do have to do it page by page and that can be time consuming. 
The biggest tip that I can give you here is to make sure that when you're scanning your copies that you capture all of the music on the page and that it's really clear to read. I can't stress how important this is, um, particularly later on down the track if you want to you know, turn your digital version of your score, your PDF, into a notation file, you really, really do need to make sure that this step is done right before you go on any further. So by that I mean you need to have no missing edges. So if you look down the edges of the score and there are missing bar lines at the end of the page or some of the staves are a little bit crooked, you're going to really run into problems later down the track and make life difficult. So do it right now to avoid heartache later on. Now, books can be quite difficult. Um, you need to try and press them as flat as possible. Otherwise, you'll end up with that sort of curved staves um, towards the spine in the middle of the pages. Um, but it's possible to make it look okay. When you're actually doing the scanning process with a scanning machine, it's usually good to choose a resolution of around 300 dpi. If the music's really detailed and very small, you might want to test a higher resolution. And you should be scanning in grayscale or black and white. You don't need to scan in colour, so um, I can't really think of any reason that a score would need to be scanned in colour. Um, just choose a black and white or grayscale option. Nowadays, in addition to using a scanner machine, you also have the option of scanning music in inverted commas with an app on your iPad or iPhone or Android device. And this is actually what I do now. It's so much quicker than my old scanner, which, you know, did that really slow process one page at a time. In essence, you're just taking a photo with your device and asking the app that you take that photo with to convert it to a PDF. It's super fast and you can see what you've captured instantly and you'll know whether you need to redo the picture, you know, for any reason if it's not clear enough. The app choices for scanning, um, you, you don't necessarily have to choose a music specific scanning app. You can use any scanning app. A, a proper scanning app though, however, is better than just taking a photo with your camera on your device because the app is designed for detailed text or character reading and those apps also allow you to crop and enhance what you've captured. Lastly, they will also allow you to export the results as a PDF file or even into other formats too. Some of the apps that I'll mention later on in this episode, the ones that do the transformation part of the score into a notation file format, also have an inbuilt scanning option. So you may not need to use a separate scanning app, but just for the moment, I'll talk about the apps that are specifically designed to scan documents and a couple of the options there. The one I use uh, the most is called Genius Scan and it's available for iOS and Android as well. There's a free and a paid version. I have the paid one. I think from memory the paid one removes ads and there may be a couple of other features that you get with the pro one as opposed to the, the free version. Other people I know use JotNot Pro which is another scanning app. I'll just talk through the process in G Genius Scan but it's really similar in all scanning apps. So. My first step is to lay the piece of paper on a flat surface. Now, um, I actually do lie it on carpet. <laughs> There's a reason for that. Not specifically because I want it to be lay laid out on carpet, but um, the second thing that I'm going to say is that the lighting needs to be good and the place in my house where the lighting is the best is on the carpet next to my front window. Now, the lighting is super important here. You really want to make sure that you've got no shadows on the piece of paper, um, either from uh, the sun itself and objects that might be in the room or shadows from overhead lights. So, um, you know, I've tried scanning in my kitchen where I put the piece of paper on the kitchen bench and take a photo there, but really the overhead light and my head gets in the way, so I end up with a shadow on it. So the best place for me is next to my front window, which has sort of nice filtered light, you know, with a light, um, lightweight curtain there, and it, it just gives me the best result. So I scan music there. I also use this um, app to scan things like receipts that I may have, paper copies of receipts that I need or documents that I need to send to someone in an electronic format. So, so that's what I do there. Now you simply open up the app and you press the little camera icon that's in the Genius Scan app. You position the, the device camera over the document and you really want to be directly above and square on. You can look through and see how square or not square you are, you know, with when you're looking at the score through your device camera. 
The app actually does do some perspective corrections, but really I think it's better to do the best job you can up front to save having to fix up things later on. You want to check the focus, just make sure that the, the focus is okay on the camera, and then you take the picture. Once you've taken that picture, just do a, a quick check on the screen. Have you captured everything? Did you capture all the edges? Is, is it in focus? Is it readable? And then the app gives you a few options to crop what you've captured or enhance it or rotate it if you've captured it upside down. It's not a big deal if you've captured things upside down or sideways. You can always rotate them later on, so, so not, a, not, a, not a hassle there. Once you've fixed it all up, um, I actually have the auto, I think it's auto enhance turned on and it kind of instantly enhances it and makes it black and white as opposed to a photographic image of my score and that seems to work quite well. After I've done that, I will then save my scanned uh, document as a new doc or you want new document or you want to save it maybe into an existing document if you're halfway through scanning a multiple page uh, score, you might want to add it to an existing document. If it's the first page and I'm saving it as a new document, I will try to remember to name the file at that point because uh, Genius Scan will give you an automatic file name, which is usually the date, the day and the date. And it's really good if you can remember to rename it um, because you may forget down the track and it just makes it so much easier to search and find, for th find things later on. So I will rename it with the score name, uh, whatever it is at that point. Now, if the score has more than one page, um, you can go back to the camera app in Genius Scan. You can scan the second page. And then when you go to save it, it will say, do you want to save it to a new document or an existing document? And at that point, if you're on page two, you really do want to save it um, into the existing document that you just created in the previous step. So instead of having separate PDF documents for each page, I find it works much better to have one single document with multiple pages. So keep adding like that until you're finished. And then once you're done, you basically save that file and I export it somewhere central like Dropbox or Google Drive. Now, the reason for saving it there is it's really easy for me to access from my laptop or from my iPad still or from my phone or anywhere else. So um, save it somewhere central. Cloud-based saving option is a really useful thing. Um, iCloud, you might use that um, as an option and there are a few other ones that are similar. Now that you have the score in a PDF format, the next steps will depend on what you want to do with that score. I want to cover reading and annotating scores on a device or laptop first, and then we'll look later on at you know, transform, transforming it to a notation file format. So the reading slash annotating scores on a device, particularly on an iPad um, or Android device, a, a tablet type of device, this is one of the reasons that many musicians purchase a tablet in the first place. It's in order to have their scores in a digital for format and for them to be accessible really easily and for you to be able to have a whole library on your tablet device. Having scores in a digital format like this means that you may not have to lug as many books around with you. And uh, there are people that I know that use their iPad on stage at gigs just to read music in that way rather than having to have paper copies of charts anymore. So that can be really, really useful. In addition, you can annotate scores. And this is really great, obviously, for rehearsals or performance purposes, but really useful for score analysis as well. So you may be working with students that need to analyse scores, and this can be a great way to do it in a digital format. So in order to read the score in a practical way and to annotate it as well, you need to open up the PDF that you've created in some kind of PDF reader app. Now, there are many, many options for PDF reader apps which are non-music specific, but it's really best to choose a music specific app because there are lots of features which are really useful for musicians and they've been designed for this, you know, this actual purpose in mind. Now, my choice for this is an app called Fourscore, which is around $15 or so, and that's an iPad app. If you're on an Android device, there's a similar one called Mobile Sheets. I haven't tried it myself because I don't have an Android device, but I've heard that it's very similar to Fourscore. That one's around the same price, I think maybe a couple of dollars less, maybe $13 or so. 
Both of these apps have features that are specifically designed for musicians. So they allow you to do things like organise your music into set lists. You can really easily search your scores by composer or by title or by tags that you assign. So search tags that you might assign to the scores. You can really, really easily annotate the music within the Fourscore app or the Music Sheets app. They have an inbuilt pencil and pen and highlighter. You can also add music symbols to your score called stamps. So um, if your composer has forgotten to put dynamics into the score, for instance, there are actually a series of music symbols, so a piano sign and a forte sign that you can just drag onto the score in the correct place. There's also included uh, things like tuner and metronome and an on-screen keyboard. So in Fourscore, I've found this really useful in the past. I've been um, singing, you know, a few years ago with an a cappella group and it's really useful to have a tuner just built into the app in case, you know, I don't forget the, the actual physical tuner. I've got it there within the app. I can open up the score there. Um, just choose the note and the whole group can hear it. There's also a metronome if you just want to check the speed of the piece. And really usefully an on-screen keyboard. So that's great if you've got, you know, members of a, say, a choir that are not fantastic sight singers. They can test out little bits of the score using the on-screen keyboard and, and hear what they're supposed to sound like. In addition to that, there's also an ability to link an audio file, so like a backing track to the score. So while you're reading the score, you can actually press play on an audio file. And in the case of the a cappella group, um, I had created some scores in Sibelius. So I was able to just generate an audio file from Sibelius with the click of a button. And then we would add that to four score so that we could hear all the parts and sing along with them while we were learning the song. So that made rehearsals quite a bit quicker. When you're using these apps, um, I have to say the page turns are so super fast. I, it actually took me a while to get used to how fast they were and because I would accidentally turn two or three pages in quick succession. Um, so much faster than using a physical paper score. I can't tell you how much easier it is. Uh, in addition to that, um, and this is something I find that not many people know, even if they have got the Four Score app, you can link pages for repeats that may pop up in the music. So you can be singing or playing through and get to the end of the first time bar. You can set up a link at the end of the first time bar. And so when you tap your iPad on the little link, it will send the score straight back to page one where you've got to go back, play the second time through, and then at the beginning of the first time bar, as in at the place where you need to go to the second time bar this time around, there's another link there and you can tap on that and it will take you straight to the second time bar. Really useful for coders where everybody gets lost and, you know, fumbling with paper and what page are we up to. You can just set up all these links and it just makes, again, the rehearsal process a lot quicker and performance if you're still using music in the performance as well. You can turn pages with your finger by tapping on the iPad screen or, or tablet screen, but if you are a musician that uses two hands to play your instrument, like the piano or the guitar or any wind instruments um, and so on, you can actually use a pedal to turn pages with instead, which will keep your hands free to play your instrument. So that can be really useful as well and make things a lot more streamlined. So if you need to read scores and you want a digital version of your music library, it's definitely worth purchasing one of those apps. Um, it, they're, you know, one of my favourite productivity apps, I suppose, as a musician is for score and for reading, reading and annotating scores. After the break, we'll look at the magical part of the process and how apps can work to transform your score into a file type that you can edit, a notation file type. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast is brought to you by the Midnight Music Community. The Midnight Music Community is an online space for music teachers who'd like help using technology in their music lessons. There are online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, music tech news, and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake. I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit midnightmusic.com.au. 
midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. That's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. Let's look now at the other reason that you might want to scan music and that is to automatically transform it into a notation format. The benefits of doing this are huge, of course, because you can play the score back and hear it. You can transpose it to a new key. You can rearrange the score. So you might want to change a viola part into a violin three part because you don't have any viola players. Or you might want to make a string arrangement into a brass one and so on. Before the music scanning technology came along, if you wanted to do any of those things, you would have had to have man manually entered all of the notes yourself into the notation software. So you would literally do copying work where you're copying the notes from the paper score into your notation software. Nowadays, there is actually the option to have music scanning software do that magical transformation for you and to save you the work of manually ent entering the notes. I want to talk through a little warning first um, and some of the limitations of the process, I suppose. It's really good in this process to have some realistic expectations. Not many people realise that there's actually amazing technology involved with this whole process and you might be familiar with OCR, optical character recognition. And in this case, you know, similar for music, um, I know that there is a term OMR, optical music recognition. This is the same sort of process that's used for converting printed books into Word document format or for reading text out loud for the blind. With regular text, uh, software has been trained over the years to recognise different fonts and characters so that it's become quite accurate over time. Now, there's an extra level of difficulty for the software when recognising music characters and elements because there are things like parallel elements that need to be interpreted. So multiple voices, for instance, on one stave. The notes need to be recognised in this process and given a pitch and things like transposing instruments need to be taken into account and articulations are di and dynamics which are to do with a specific save are just nearby the stave. So the software has to sort of recognise that specific dynamics are to be attached to a specific stave and to be read in that way. So in the early days, I didn't find there was a massive level of accuracy. You know, you'd do some scanning and think, mm, not quite sure if it's worth scanning or whether it's actually quicker to put the notes in manually. But nowadays, um, I really do think that it's improved a lot over the years and it is a lot more accurate than it used to be. So it is saving time, um, if you're, particularly if you're not fast at entering notes in your notation software program. There's still going to be times when the interpretation of the score is not perfect and you're going to need to fix up the copy that's been interpreted by the software. And this can depend in part on the actual score that you've uh, used originally, the one that you've scanned originally. So simple scores, simple musically I'm talking, and ones that are clear and easy to read, you'll have fewer problems with those. They'll be interpreted quite well. There'll be a high level of accuracy and you'll be good to go. However, there are more problems with scores that are complex musically, I've found. So things like syncopated rhythms, so lots of dots and extra tails on notes. If there are lots of fast notes, um, that can be problematic sometimes. Lots of triplets can be hard work as well. Scores that use really old style music fonts can be hard. Scores that ha are handwritten, the handwriting recognition is, is coming along, but it's still not, you know, fantastic. Uh, and scores that are in bad shape in the first place, and by in bad shape, I'm talking the actual paper copy here. So if your score that you're scanning has lots of pencil markings that have been erased, or there's, you know, things that are still left on the score, or there's maybe missing ink on the copy, you know, some, some scores have sort of got notes that are half there, a bit rubbed off as such. Um, maybe the score has crooked staves on the page. If you've got a copy that's like that, I can already tell you you're going to have more issues with it and it's going to be hard work for the scanning software to recognise it accurately. So I tend to choose whether I'm going to scan a score or not bother <laughs> based on what it looks like. So if it's one of those ones where there's many syncopated rhythms and lots of fast notes and so on and it's a bad quality copy, I may choose not to scan in the first place because it, it 
you know, there'll be so much fixing up to do. I'm quite quick at putting notes into Sibelius, so it would be quicker for me to just manually put them in because a lot of scores have copying and pasting that you can take advantage of. The more fixing up there is to do, the easier it you know, becomes to just input from scratch. So you really need, do need to toss that up. However, you can just give it a try and see what happens. If it's just a complete mess, that's okay. You've lost nothing. But, you know, just be prepared that you may have to input it manually. I come from the point of view that anything that the scanner does correctly, I treat as a bonus. So, so I sort of take the view that I'm going to have to put it in, you know, in manually myself. But if the scanning works pretty well, then I'm happy. It saved me some time. Now, in terms of app options for this part of the process, you can use either your tablet device, so iPad or Android device, or you can use your laptop or desktop computer to do this. Now, as I mentioned, this is the complex part of the process from a technical point of view. So if you're going to be doing it often and you want a high level of accuracy, you will need to invest in decent software. I'm going to share with you three sort of pro level options. And then one other option, which is a, a more inexpensive option, but it has less features. So you need to toss up, you know, what it is that you need from the software. The first one I'll talk about is Photoscore by Neurotron, which is the one that I've used for years on my laptop computer. Now, they have a free version that comes bundled with Sibelius. The free version has limitations, but it can be good if you want to test it out and see how it works and what it does. So the free version, uh, the limitations with that are things like it only allows you to scan 12 staves per page. So if you are working with a vocal and piano score, each system on a single page is going to count as three of those staves. So as soon as you've got four systems or more, if you've got more than four systems, then you're going to run into problems because you've only allowed to scan 12 at once. Uh, it doesn't read text, the free version. It doesn't read notes and rests uh, that are anything beyond one dot that have one dot after them. So um, you can read a dotted crotchet, for instance, but you couldn't read uh, a double dot uh, in the software. It will also allow only up to 16th notes and things like no irregular bars and so on. There's a few other limitations as well. So it's really good if you just want to test out scanning and see if it's for you. The pro version is well worth the investment if you're going to be scanning music really often. The pro version is around uh, $250 um, and that's US dollars and it's called Photoscore Ultimate. An alternative to Photoscore is called SmartScore, which is around a similar price. I think it's a little bit more, maybe $300. And that one used to come bundled with Finale, but as of Finale 25, that, that bundling has ceased. But you can still access the SmartScore software on its own. If you want to do this step on your iPad or Android device instead of on your laptop, then you can use an iPad version or Android device version of Photoscore. Now, Neurotron have a, another app called Notate Me, and that's a handwriting app. It's fantastic. I've used that quite a bit, and it's um, always really impressive when I show that in workshops. That app will actually allow you to handwrite on your tablet screen and Notate Me will transform your handwritten score into, you know, like a notation printed score. So it looks really great. Now, as part of that app, they have a, an in-app feature for Photoscore. Now, the total cost for this app, if you wanted Notate Me with the in-app purchase of Photoscore, the total cost is going to be around $70. So it's about $40 for Notate Me and $30 for the Photoscore in-app purchase. Now this might sound like a high cost for an app, but if you consider that this software is doing a really complex job that can ultimately save you a lot of time, I really do think it's worth the money that you spend on it. It's also an inexpensive alternative to the $250 photo score that you'll buy for your desktop. So if you're happy to work on your iPad, you're gonna be able to do it a lot more cheaply. Before I get into a few tips on how to scan with success, because I do have a few tips there after doing it for quite some time, I want to mention a fast, inexpensive app option for iPad users, which is actually less than $5, and it's called Sheet Music Scanner. Now, this is a fairly new recent app, and it will allow you to open the PDF that we created earlier. So I talked about, you know, scanning a PDF earlier in the session. So you can take a PDF and open it up with Sheet Music Scanner. 
and it will do this transformation into a notation format. Um, you don't have to have scanned at first. You don't have to be opening up a PDF. You can actually take a photo of the score within the app itself. And once you do that and it's read the score and transformed it, you can play it back and you can change the tempo of it and you can transpose the score as well. I've only tested it with quite simple scores and I've had copies that are really good quality and it's worked really well with those. There's not really been any errors. I haven't tried it with a more complex score though, so I'm, I'm going to be interested to give that a go. There's no editing at the moment available in the app, but I understand that's coming in a future version. So if you do end up scanning a score, which is a bit complex and it has come up with a few errors, you'll be able to fix those in the Sheet Music Scanner app. So that one's definitely worth looking at. If you maybe just want to give it a go, see if it works for you. So let's get back to PhotoScore and those more sort of pro versions of software and talk about this whole transformation process, how it works, what the steps are, and I'll give you a few little tips along the way that I've um, discovered by trial and error, as you do. So there are essentially four main steps to doing this. So step one is what we've already talked about. You scan the music to get it into a PDF format. Step two is to use PhotoScore and I'm using PhotoScore here because this is the one I'm familiar with, but I'm, I'm gathering or guessing that it's going to be a fairly similar process if you're using SmartScore as well. So step two is to use PhotoScore to read the score. And that's, what they, that's the terminology they use in the software. This is the actual transformation part where the PDF automatically becomes a, an interactive notation format that you can do stuff to. If you're using the iPad or Android version of PhotoScore within the Notate Me app that I mentioned just before, you'll actually need to take a photo of the score within the app itself. You can't import PDFs at this stage, so you'll just go straight to the app and take a picture of the score there, and then the, the app will read the score and turn it into this notation format. So that transformation bit really only takes a few seconds. It, it, the processing part takes just a few seconds to do. And then after it's done that, you're on to step three. And this is what I call the fun part. <laughs> it's not really that fun sometimes. Um, this is where you will need to fix up any errors that the software has read with the score. So basically, this at this point of the, the process is that you compare the original score that you had with what PhotoScore has interpreted for you. And in PhotoScore on the desktop version, at least because I've used that quite a bit, you can actually see both on the screen at once. The top part of the screen is like a zoomed in image of your physical score, and then you can compare it with what's underneath, which is the interpreted version of the score. I often find it's easiest to have the physical paper version of the score next to me on the desk, and I just compare it to that as I'm going. Why are there errors in the first place? I actually got asked this recently. Um, why are there errors? Why can it not magically make everything correct the first time through? It really does its best to interpret the score correctly. But, you know, sometimes there are complex things in scores which can make it quite difficult. And as we mentioned before, you know, bad quality copies can also make it difficult uh, for the, the software to interpret the music. So it's not always correct. You need to go through and fix any errors before moving on to the next stage, which is to send the score to your notation program. Now, PhotoScore helps you out by identifying most of the errors on the screen in red. You can sort of see red around. So I, I do a quick scan through each of the pages and I look for the red parts and I fix the errors there. Um, it will tell you if there's things like um, bars that don't add up correctly. It will actually show you the bar that doesn't add up correctly, it knows that it's it's not quite right with the time signature that it's interpreted and it will say, hang on a minute, there's an extra quaver in this bar which shouldn't be there, it's not adding up to 4-4, four, four. I've got this extra quaver and it, it's not quite right. Um, so you need to look at those and you need to work out in that bar what is it that's making the bar look like it's got an extra quaver beat in it and then you'll basically correct that. You'll change a note in there um, to the correct note value or delete a note or, or whatever it needs to be. You don't necessarily need to fix all of the errors that you find in PhotoScore. I have some basic bare minimum things that I will fix because I actually find some things are easier to fix when I'm across in Sibelius because I'm quick at using Sibelius. So sometimes it can be quicker to leave some things to actually do in Sibelius itself. 
As a bare minimum, I will go through and make sure that Photoscores interpreted the time signature correctly. And that includes any time signature changes that might happen halfway through a score. So this is particularly um, pertinent for orchestral scores. You know, if you if you've scanned an orchestral part of some sort, um, do double check that it's interpreted all of the time signature changes if there are multiple ones throughout the whole score. Um, I'll do the same for key signatures as well. So just make sure that they're all correct. As mentioned before, I will make sure that all the bars add up correctly. I just find it's a little bit problematic if you leave that part. Photoscore protests a little bit if you want to try and send it to Sibelius without bars adding up correctly. And Sibelius doesn't love it either, so it's just easier to do it at this point in time. Two other things that I always um, correct before I send to Sibelius is that the multi-rests in an orchestral score are correct. So you know the multi-rests where you've got like a bar, you know, and it, it will say that this is an eight bar rest, um, you know, for the flute that I've part that I've scanned in. I will make sure that the number eight is correct on there and compares properly to my physical score. Often multi-rests are not identified. It might look like a multi-rest, but the number may not be correct. It's really easy in Photoscore just to click on it and to change it to the correct number and make sure it adds up. You will save yourself a lot of headaches if you do that at this point, um, as opposed to when you send it to Sibelius later on. Um, it's not the end of the world if you don't do it at this point, because you can just add bars in Sibelius, but I just find if you, if you can, fix that here. The last thing I will um, always fix as well is that staves are labelled correctly. And the particular example I'm thinking of is when you've got, for instance, a piano vocal score, which might start on page one with just piano playing the introduction. And then on page two, the voice part might come in. And then on page three, maybe a second voice part comes in. So you have a changing number of staves on each of the pages. So page one might just have the two piano staves left and right hand. On the second page, you've got three staves in each system because you've got the voice part and the left and right hand of the piano. And then maybe page four, you've gone to four staves per system with the two vocal parts and the piano part. It's fine, you can actually deal with this in Photoscore and it's not too hard. You just need to go through every page in Photoscore and click at the left hand side of the stave and you need to say what this stave is. So on page one, you'll say that this is piano and, and you can set up the labels within Photoscore itself. You'll say this is piano A for the right hand, this is piano B for the left hand. When you got onto page two, you'll make sure that it knows that this is voice part one piano A and piano B. And then on page three, you'll make sure it knows that it's voice part two, voice part one, voice part two, piano A and piano B and so on. And you work your way through each of the pages. And again, doing this now will save yourself a lot of heartache in the long run, because if you don't label them correctly, Photoscore will interpret the top line, no matter what page you're on, the top line as being all one part. So if you take my example, you might have right hand piano part and by the time you get to page two, the right hand piano part will be joined up to the voice part on page two and so on throughout the whole score. It can be problematic when you get across to Sibelius if it's all mixed up like that. So do do it in photo score and then um, you know fix other minor things in Sibelius or Finale or whatever notation program you're using. I generally don't worry too much about fixing things like lyrics and dynamics and articulations. That's just my personal preference. Um, I, I fix those when I get across to Sibelius. And that's because I can do those things quite quickly in Sibelius. And I just find they can be a little bit messy or problematic, you know, when they're done in, in Photoscore. So that's my personal thing. Um, other people may have a different workflow, but that, that's what's worked for me over time. Step four in this process is to send the file that you've been editing in Photoscore to your notation software. And your notation software doesn't have to be Sibelius. I've mentioned that because that's the one that I've used, but you could be using anything else like Finale. You could be using MuseScore, NoteFlight, the Notion app on your iPad, the new Dorico program or something else. If you are on the desktop version of Photoscore and you use Sibelius, there's actually a little button which says send to Sibelius and you basically click that, Sibelius opens up automatically and your score will appear in there. So that can be really quick and useful. 
If you don't use Sibelius and you are using, you know, your iPad or Android device or you're using some other software program, notation software program, you can export the file as a music XML file and that is a no universal notation file type. The reason for exporting as music XML as opposed to some other option like say MIDI as an option is that music XML is a universal notation file type and it takes along with it information like dynamics and articulations and so on which are specific to notation. If you were to export your file as a MIDI file, it won't take a lot of that information with it because a MIDI file is intended for playback, it's intended for sound only. So choose Music XML and then you'll send it across to your software, your notation software for further editing if you choose to. Now Sheet Music Scanner, that inexpensive app option, does also have an export as Music XML option. So you can, you can do that there and like with Photoscore, you can send it across to your notation software. I should also mention that you don't necessarily have to send your score to a notation software program. You can do quite a bit of fixing up in Photoscore and that might be enough for you. And then, you know, you can do whatever it is you want from there. So transpose it. You've got some limited editing options, so you can transpose it there and create an audio file for you to play along with and so on. But the process that I've, you know, used scanning for in the first place is usually to get the notes into my notation software quickly. To sum up this whole thing, this sounds like a little bit of a complex process, but it really isn't. Once you get the hang of it, it can be quite quick and you'll, you'll get a workflow going. Just don't forget that it's really good to have realistic expectations about the whole process if you're wanting to create a notation file. I thought I'd talk through my workflow example, the steps that I take and, you know, what I use each device for in the process. And then a second one, you know, as just as an example as well. My personal process is that I scan the paper score with Genius Scan on my iPad. I then save it from Genius Scan into Dropbox. And Dropbox allows me to access it in many different locations. So I, I usually at this point go to my Mac laptop. I'll open up Photoscore and I'll import the PDF that I've saved into Dropbox into Photoscore so that I can, you know, scan the music there. I fix up the major errors that I mentioned earlier in Photoscore and then I click the little send to Sibelius button and then do any last editing in there. And so once I've done my rearranging or transposing, I can print out the score from Sibelius or I can send electronic copies to my ensemble members. So that's one example workflow. Another one, if you were going to use just your iPad, for instance, um, your workflow could be something like opening Photoscore in, within the Notate Me app, taking a picture of the score and fixing up the errors within the app, and then exporting the resulting music XML file and opening it in the Notion app on the iPad for further editing. I really hope you found that information useful. I know it's a, a big topic to cover and I'm, I'm going to cover aspects of certain parts of what I've talked about today. So for instance, I'd like to do a little another episode just on four score and reading of, of um, music on your tablet device because it's another area which is something that I'm asked a lot. So four score is not the only option there. There are some other options too which you might find useful. So I'll, I'll cover that in a future episode. Now, members of the Midnight Music community can download a copy of all this information in the How to Scan Music training area, which I've set up inside the community. I've included some links there to tutorial videos for Fourscore and for Photoscore and some detailed step-by-step -step instructions for using Photoscore itself. If you're not already a member of the Midnight Music community and you'd like to access those materials, you can join at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. So here's your action step for this episode. If you've been wanting to give scanning music a go, try it out. I would suggest just giving it a, a go. Explore the software or app options if you haven't already and down, maybe download the light or demo version of the app if there is one. That'll give you a chance to test it out and see if you are going to like the process and stick with it and um, find it useful and productive for your music editing. I'd really love to hear how you go if you try one out. You can either tweet me at katiesw1, that's S for Sam, katiesw1, or you can connect with me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash 
Midnight Music. I'd also love it if you could take the time, just a couple of minutes, to leave a podcast rating and review in iTunes. It really helps other teachers just like you discover the show. The Music Tech Teacher Podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe, a music tech trainer, consultant and speaker from Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash five. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.